Report.org. Hi, everybody. I'm Crystal Haynes. Tonight on Greater Boston, GBH's Paris Alston sits down with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley to discuss making history in local and national politics, a divided Congress, and her take on the 2024 elections. Then a New York City favorite has arrived right here in Boston. The head chef of Blue Ribbon Brasserie joins me on the heels of their opening in Fenway, along with a sampling of some items off their New England-inspired menu. And later, a look at a Boston neighborhood re building itself 50 years after it was torn down in an attempt to build a highway. In 2018, Ayanna Presley became the first black congresswoman in Massachusetts. Now, prior to that, she was the first woman of color on the Boston City Council, paving the way for a line of progressive women who've come into office after her. In the wake of her five-year anniversary of being elected, GBH News' Paris Alston sat down with the congresswoman in her district at Dudley Cafe in Nubian Square. They discussed her historic political career so far, her support for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, and how they both start their days. I'm really a morning person. Yeah. You know, like I get up probably between 5 and 5.30 every single day. Wow. Okay, I got you beat because I yes. get up at 3 to go, okay. go host morning edition. So. <laughs> All right, yeah. yeah. So yes. think of me okay. when you're up I at that hour. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm talking to women in power. And today we're at Dudley Cafe in Nubian Square to speak with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. There's nothing like being home. I work in Washington, but I work for the people of the Massachusetts 7. And so when I get to, to come home and just to be... Um, just in community, uh, to be in proximity, um, it's always very grounding. Right now, there's a lot of pressure because of the split that's in the Democratic Party over the conflict in Gaza and the war between Israel and Hamas. And people are looking towards Congressman Jeffries to, to support those who have come out against, very firmly, against what Israel has been doing in Gaza. I know that you've called for a ceasefire. Several of your, your colleagues of the squad have done the same. But also, they've, you know, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib of Michigan has been censured for, for comments and rhetoric that she has, has said about the war. She is Palestinian of herself, we should note. So what, what, how did the Democrats, what, what, how would they be defined by this moment on this particular issue? Because it has the potential to split the party. It already is. Mm. Well, you know, uh, we're a big tent party and we're a big tent caucus. And, um, you know, even though we may, off, we, may, we may at times see a different path to achieve an end, I think it's fair to say we all want the same end, which is uh, peace, you know, lasting peace. And, and, and I also think it's important to note that uh, I'm certainly not, you know, standing alone or even in a, in a very, very small minority when it comes to uh, calling for a, a ceasefire. Um, this is uh, something that uh, well over 40 members of Congress have called for, um, that the UN has called for, the President of France, the, the Pope, um, and certainly the millions that have uh, mobilized uh, in our streets um, in advocating for, for peace. I support a ceasefire because I want to save lives, all lives. And very very often in government, these unjust binary choices are foisted onto us. And I reject that on every issue, not just when it comes to Israel and Gaza. We're headed into a big election year. Mm. Obviously, there's a presidential election, but there are all these congressional elections, too, that are going to be very consequential for, for where we go from here. Mm. Are, are you excited about a Biden-Harris ticket in 2024? Yeah. You know, as you said, our challenges have never been greater, and um, and every day it's very clear how shall I say this? I think a lot about January 6th and just how close we came uh, to losing it all, right? And what we have seen is this emboldened, coordinated, unrelenting assault on our democracy. Um, rollbacks and the undermining of gains that have been made uh, in civil rights. And under this Republican uh, majority in the House, every day just seeking to exact harm. Uh, and so we have to do everything possible 
uh, to defeat them so that we can right the wrongs and uh, undo the harm that they have caused. So it sounds like that the best possible option to do that right now is who we have in the White House. Oh, absolutely. You are a style icon in many ways, not just from, <laughs> from your appearance, but from how you legislate. And okay, I, and okay. I, I want to walk through this with okay. you because I was going to say, who said that? <laughs> okay. I knew well, the New York Times did name you one of their 93 people for South People of the Year know. in 2022. I literally just wear black every day, so I don't know. But, 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 it's, I'll but take it's, a, it. it's, it's complimentary, yeah, too, right? Yeah. Because you mentioned compassion and your legislating, and you do things like, like really push legislating joy, which you did through our. our attempting to do it through the Crown Act, uh, which bans ha racialized hair discrimination, and obviously that's that's a core to you because of your own journey. With yes, by the way, shout out practices. to your braider. Okay. <laughs> she, she was my braider. roommate. She does have a because, business. I'll tag her. Okay, okay. You know, <laughs> Thank you it's very such much. an intimate relation, relationship. Yes, it is. You know, it really I, is. I embrace my, my alopecia crown, um, but I, I loved having braids, and, and, I, loved, it, yeah. and I loved that relationship with, with my braider. But, but yes, you know, I do seek to legislate uh, equity, um, to legislate healing, to legislate justice, to legislate, uh, you know, joy. And there is a, a, an incredible joy when you can show up in the world fully authentically and unapologetically as yourself. I, I have to be real, there are moments when I do miss my hair. Um, I'm still not at a point where my journey includes wearing a wig. You never say never. Um, my husband, uh, who I'm just so fortunate, you know, to, to have as my partner, says that he does not believe that alopecia robbed me of my beauty. He believes that it revealed it. You know? I do want to pick up, since we're talking about hair, because I remember a tweet from a few, a couple years ago where um, your, your, bon your daughter, Cora, yes. wanted to dye her oh hair gosh. blue. <laughs> Okay. And she made a PowerPoint presentation yes. and a all six this stuff. Page slide yes, and she was young. She was relatively yes, young. And yes. you all said no. But has she been able to dye oh her hair since then? Can I tell you <laughs> the backlash I got yeah, people on that? Were away. They, kind of went they on that. came for me. <laughs> Uh, well, you, I will, I'm happy to report um, that actually, you know, we, we have supported her in her personal and self-expression. And, um, you know, she has dyed her hair. <laughs> um, she's 15 now. You know, we're, we're very proud of her. And, um, you know, I think about her a lot. I think about her a lot. Um, you know, at her eighth grade graduation, was the day that the Dobbs decision came out and Roe was overturned. And I, you know, remember just starting the day out feeling so hopeful and optimistic about her future. And, and of course I still am. But in real time, when that decision came out, um, I felt so heavy, I felt dread, because I felt that it was precedent. I didn't know what else might be coming that would mean that my daughter could grow up in a world where she had fewer rights uh, than I grew up with. And uh, abortion is health care. Um, and so uh, that work of reproductive rights, of maternal justice, I've also used the, the, the power of, of the pen as a, as a lawmaker um, around um, the maternal morbidity crisis and its disparate impact on, on black women, which is very linked to this march by Republicans towards really a nationwide ban uh, on abortion. So what is that? It's forced birth. And when you consider the fact that black women are, are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth or post-birth in complications, this is a matter of life and death. And my own uh, paternal grandmother, Grandma Carrie, who I have a picture of uh, in, our, in our home, I have a shelf that I call our, 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 our wall, it's like our ancestor wall. And I, I never got to know her because she died in the 1950s, giving birth to my father's youngest brother. And so the fact that uh, uh, my paternal grandmother, Grandma Carrie, uh, died in the 1950s in childbirth, and that in 2023, that black women would still be three to four times more likely to die in childbirth or post-birth in complications is unacceptable. And so this is why I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't mind taking hard votes. I, I don't. Uh, I'm okay if everyone doesn't like me. Uh, I'm in this to do the work of changing and saving lives. And I'm gonna organize, mobilize, legislate like lives depend on it, because they do. What do you want the little girls who are looking at you now to take away from your leadership? 
Mm. You belong. Well, next, when Blue Ribbon Brasserie opened over 30 years ago in New York City, it drew inspiration from the owners, who are brothers, and their time spent in New England. And now that menu comes home as the restaurant tours opened a 260-seat restaurant in Kenmore Square. And I'm joined now by head chef Dan Bazanotti, who brought in some of their offerings. And we always love when we have food in the studio because this spread is amazing. <laughs> So talk to me about the, the restaurant and its concept. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, we're super happy to be here. We just opened. Uh, the restaurant concept, as you kind of said, Eric and Bruce uh, came up with this 30 years ago and opened their flagship brasserie, which is you know their take on their experience in France and then all the food that they grew up eating. Um, so everything is just near and dear to their hearts. All the dishes that you see, everything from you know the plateau to the house-made charcuterie, all the way to fried chicken. Uh, so it's just comfort food, but just done really well and very approachable. And now we're doing it here in Boston. Now we we talked about how the owner sort of drew on their experience coming to New England. You're a New England guy. So what did you bring to this menu that, you know, was quintessential New England? Yeah, I mean, you're kind of looking at... Yeah, seafood. You're looking at it. Uh, some beautiful lobster, Jonah crabs, um, you know, all the oysters and clams. They're just amazing. I mean, we have a beautiful raw bar. So when you, when you walk into the restaurant, you know, not only are you welcomed by the 70 foot bar, but there's a raw bar right there. And on the ice, we're showcasing all the local stuff. Uh, we had Welks the other day, razor clam ceviche tonight. Uh, so we just have some really cool stuff and fun things going on and just showcases New England and the waters. And you all are super intentional about the product that you cook and that you put out. Yes, yes. I mean, doing steak tastings, duck tastings, uh, everything from the flour we use to the fried chicken and obviously all our shellfish. Yeah. Uh, just picking the best quality of everything and working hand in hand with all our purveyors. What can folks expect when they, you know, walk in for a dining experience? I think the cool thing about the brasserie here is you can have whatever experience you want. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a community center. It's a place for everyone. So you can walk in after a day at work and have a beer and a burger at the bar. You can come in with a group and celebrate and get a plateau and share fondue and have these exciting, fun things. Um, you know, or you can come in and have your appetizer, Caesar salad, and a steak frite. So it's kind of whatever you want to do. There's all little different parts of the dining room. There's parts that are a little bit more chill where you're just going to relax and have a quiet area or the hustle and bustle of the bar, the raw bar where you're watching our team open oysters and do fun specials. So it, you can kind of create your own experience, which is really special, I think. So Boston has a ton of restaurants. How do you guys sort of stand out from all of the other, you know, options that folks have? Yeah, I mean, Boston is a great scene and I've been involved in it for a very long time. Um, I think that we bring something very special to the table. And as I was mentioning about like the community mm -hmm. center, I mean, we're a place for everyone. And Blue Ribbon's past, they're known for having the chefs eat at their restaurants. Mm -hmm. So since we've been open, uh, the reception from a lot of our chef friends and purveyors has been great, having them come in, see the space, enjoy the food. And they're very excited for us as well. So we're just really ready to be a part of that and uh, welcome them in with the final opening of our third restaurant in the hotel. Do you get nervous when other chefs come in? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, they no. like to, uh, you know, give me give me trouble, but uh, everyone is very friendly and we have a great time. That's awesome. Let's talk about the food you brought. Um, yeah, please. This seafood tower is amazing. Uh, and of course, New England, I mean, we, we know seafood, I, I would argue, probably the best, so. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this is what I would definitely start with. I mean, you're getting six of the freshest oysters, so we get all different types. Uh, using Island Creek oysters, we're getting stuff from Maine. Um, you know, I'm on the phone every morning with like, what kind of cool oysters do we have today? Oh, we have a Winter Cove oyster, and these, you know, why are they special? And I can only get a hundred of them today. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Um, clams, these uh, little neck clams that are coming from Duxbury, which are just amazing. Uh, some of the best raw clams that I've had. Uh, even just down to our shrimp cocktail, just buying this beautiful jumbo shrimp cocktail. Uh, we brine it for like five minutes and it gives it a little salinity and it's going to be some of the best shrimp cocktail. Uh, and then up on the top here, you know, a half local lobster cocktail mm -hmm. with a little bit of Cajun mayo. Uh, the New Orleans head on prawns, which are really fun. And we invite our guests to get their hands dirty and peel and eat shrimp and really get in there. And that's for me, that's one of my favorite items. And then the Jonah crab claws, which are just these local, beautiful, plump 
uh, crab claws that you just can dip in cocktail or uh, the Cajun mayonnaise, whatever you like, and just awesome. So yeah. this is this is the way to go. This is where you start. Okay, I love that. And then we're going to France a little bit with the charcuterie board. Yep. So something very special, uh, especially for me, is our uh, charcuterie. So we sell all of these individually. You can buy our pate. Uh, you can have the foie gras terrine that we have some quince and walnut uh, served with a little challah bread. Um, we also have a little prosciutto on the menu. We have a beautiful prosciutto slicer mm -hmm. right up front. So we're doing a 18 month San Daniele uh, prosciutto from Friuli, which is for me one of the best prosciutto that you can get. It's nice and sweet. Um, so we kind of have everything and you can also get a large platter and just once again, share with your whole friends and family and just have a great time. Yeah, I'm eyeing the fried chicken, which I understand is a popular menu yes. on the, uh, on, at the, the restaurant there. Yep, this is another one that is, uh, you know, a signature dish of the restaurant, something that they've been doing for a very, very long time with a not-so-secret recipe anymore. But <laughs> in the beginning, it was a secret recipe, and you can see just how beautifully crispy it is. Yeah. Uh, served with mashed potatoes, gravy, uh, braised collard greens, and a little bit of honey. Um, just so crispy. Uh, it's a whole chicken, bones and everything, so you just get in there and just attack the whole plate, and it's... It's just so awesome, and the, the secret is they use a little matzo meal oh. in, yeah, in the uh, dredge, yeah. uh, and also egg whites. A lot of people use buttermilk, mm -hmm. but it helps the um, crust adhere to the chicken, so you, know, you don't get that crust falling off as much, yeah. but some of the best stuff. All right, well, you told, we got a trade secret here. Um, <laughs> it feels like, and then of course the duck, which it looks beautiful and succulent um, here, but it seems like you, it's almost like a tour of the United States, like in, in just a few dishes right here. Yeah, there's a ton of influence on the menu, uh, you know, and we're trying new things. We can't wait. You know, we're a Boston restaurant. We are, you know, trying new things, getting all the local stuff that we can get. Um, you know, for example, that duck dish with sweet leeks and just the local apples that are in the sauce. You know, we're, you know, changing seasonally, using what we can use. Uh, from farms and things like that. So we're very excited and it's only day nine, but yeah. we're we're gonna be here for a very long time. Well, that's another thing I was gonna ask you, what's the feedback you, you're getting from, from guests already? It's been great and we've yeah. had so many different types of people come in. You know, we've had people who are tourists, we've had people from the hotel, business meetings, our chef friends, late night, things like that, the industry, which is really great. Uh, and everyone's just been having a great time and just, you know, when you when they walk in, they're like, wow, this is, not only beautiful, and then at the end, they're like, oh my God, I'm so full, this yeah. is great. So we're, we're really excited, we love to see that. That's, the, that's our goal, is to just make people happy. All right, well, I wanna dig in here. And Please. I'm, I'm thoughtful, I'm looking at these oysters. Is there a way where I don't look like a fool on TV eating okay. this oyster? <laughs> yes, so we'll, we'll set it up for okay, you. Okay, let's do it. So we should try one of these oysters. Okay. Uh, these are moon shoals from Barnstable. Okay. And the blue ribbon way to try it is with a little Sauce Alonzo. A little, okay, yep. what's in and, this? And so this is uh, lemon juice, mm -hmm. a little bit of our signature uh, habanero hot sauce, just a little. Okay. Give it a little zing. And uh, and then a little bit of celery and onions and black pepper. And okay. this is a very secret sauce from New York named after one of their shuckers. Mmm. Oh, I could eat a hundred of those. Yeah, it's awesome. That's amazing. That sauce is good on anything. And it's also... You can taste the freshness because, and I think that that's a, a big deal, especially like with oysters and stuff like that. Like you can taste it's plump. It's not like that mushy, yep. like feeling that you have in your, it's like, oh, and it tastes like the sea, I guess is, which is the point. And you're like, yeah, I'm a chef, obviously. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh. But that's probably the importance of making sure that you pick vendors that are giving you the best quality stuff. Yeah, I mean, we work hand in hand. I'm on the phone with Wolf's Fish, uh, Corey, a good friend of mine as well, and you know, he's telling me, okay, this weekend I have live scallops, I have some Santa Barbara uni coming for you. I'm like, okay, great, yeah, right. give it to me, give it to me, you know, like, that's, that's my morning, that's what we're talking about. Um, so that's, you know, just a really special thing, and that's what we're kind of showing the guests, and that's what we want to show them. Yeah. Okay, so I'm really afraid of the pate. <laughs> Which, oh, geez. I'm a you little nervous. Be. I'm a little nervous. What? So I'm gonna try it for the sake of science here. And um, is this this is the challah bread, right? Yep. Okay. So I'm gonna try a little bit of this. Yeah, please. And this is the what is this the 
Head, so that's the head, head cheese, cheese there, yep, which is just kind of a special at this moment. Okay. And then this is our country pate. Okay. And then the foie gras. So I think out of these three, you should definitely go Try go for the foie gras with Do a I little of the quince, too. With the quince. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me grab this. Let me yeah, I can set you oh, up Oh, thank a you. Bit. I appreciate it, Why not? Too. Yeah. So a little bit of that. Yeah. And then you'll need a little quince, just adds that nice sweetness. Okay. Yeah, and that foie gras is just super rich and delicious. This is the first time I've ever tried this before. And a little bit of walnuts. Okay. All right, there you go. All right, let's let's do it. Ready? I'm, I'm not going to leave you alone there either. I can't, All right. I can't leave foie gras alone. All right, guys, Geronimo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm talking with my mouth open. Um... That's nice. You're like, duh. I <laughs> <laughs> Creamy. That's really tasty. Delicious, like the, the kind of like sweetness from mm -hmm. the fruit, that warm spice of cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Kind of makes it all pop. We put a touch of sea salt on there as well, but just creamy and rich is just decadent. I think decadent, I was expecting it to taste like irony, like blood, like because I'm thinking of like a pate, yeah. but that was del that's delicious. Thank cool. you. Yeah. I'm glad you enjoy it. Yeah. It's, all right. Now, now I'm all now I'm amped up about it. So let's try the. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna try the. Uh, this is. Do the, that's the country pate. Country so pate. that's pork, chicken liver, and cognac. So we marinate it, we age it, uh, and then we slice a thin slice. That with the mustard is gonna be great. With the mustard. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna yeah. Do in that. France, you'd have a pate sandwich with baguette, pate, and cornichon. Well, there you go. Not French fries though. <laughs> you could. You could. Should I put should I put one of the pickles on it? Yeah, please. Okay. All right. That looks like a good little setup right there. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, I think you, you've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Get out of here, Dan. <laughs> so we'll see you we'll see you soon then? Yes! All right, good. Very don't good. be you guys, <laughs> don't be afraid of this. Because everything is delicious on here, and you, 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 but you know this, like, you know that some people might be, you know, if it's their first time trying these things, but you know the right combos. Yeah, and that's yeah. one thing, you know, when we run a special, you know, using like Welks or something where people might not be familiar, you know, we train our staff to get people excited about it. Hey, just try it, see, yeah. see what you think, see if you like it. Uh, you know, they convey our passion in the kitchen to, you know, why is it special? What did we do? You know, and they're getting the story, you know, from, from me about how I talked to the purveyor this morning or I went to go to the hatchery of the oysters and mm. saw how they're grown and things like that. So that helps to make it extra special. And then by the time you get to eating it, you're like, oh, I could... I see that. Yeah, and you guys have a great New Year's Eve menu. Um, yes, we're really excited out. about New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a special dinner going on at the Brasserie, and we have one at our other restaurant, Pescador, as well. So we have some really fun things, some party, DJ, that kind of stuff. So we are we are ready to ring in the new year, and you know, it's like a marathon until that day. So yeah. we're, we're going. I love it. Well, Chef Dan, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, Crystal, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Very excited and hope to see you at the restaurant soon. I think I'll come in. <laughs> Perfect. Now I know what you like. So yeah, be... there you go. <laughs> and finally, tonight, 50 years ago, a neighborhood in Boston's Jackson Square was demolished to make room for a highway. Well, residents and activists put a stop to that construction, but not before hundreds of homes and businesses were knocked down. GBH's Liz Nislaus visited the neighborhood recently to see and hear from residents and how they are still rebuilding decades later. Let's take a look. In Boston, one of the most expensive housing markets, the opening of a new building with affordable units is a cause for celebration. This is awesome. It's a poster child for what we should be doing. Here in Jackson Square, on the Roxbury, Jamaica Plain Line, a major redevelopment project is bringing desperately needed housing and rebuilding what had been destroyed. In the 1960s, hundreds of homes and businesses were knocked down to make room for a multi-lane highway. The artery was part of a highway master plan, a plan that envisioned more so-called radial roads in and out of Boston. It was a time of massive highway building across the country. During the next 13 years, the United States is embarking upon a gigantic public work program, construction of roads and highways. It came at a cost. The government took homes, including in the Jackson Square area. The highway battle with the most striking outcome took place in Boston. 
a city with a history of big highway projects. 150 acres of developable land in the Roxbury, Jamaica Plain area is going to be taken by this four-lane highway. We don't want it built and we're going to stop it. Anti-highway activists from communities around Boston united. They stopped the highway, but not the destruction. It's an eerie place to visit. Suddenly, in the middle of the crowded city, there are acres of open space and unnatural quiet. Homes demolished, buildings abandoned to make way for highway, sweeping through 11 acres in the Jackson Square area. And far off, at the edge of this wasteland, the city abruptly begins again. There was an absolute deconstruction of what we know today to be the most important thing that people value, which is their home, their community, their neighbors. And we lost all of that. But the community never gave up. And after decades of effort, Jackson Square is being rebuilt. It takes a long time to build back community, especially one that has been demolished. Every single time we're out for a groundbreaking or a ribbon cutting, it's just another piece of a very, very important puzzle. Piecing back a community and ultimately adding 1,400 new units of housing. It was the vision of those neighbors that came together and say, we're going to stop this highway. I'm proud that we were able to restore the community's voice here. For more on the Big Dig's impact on Boston, head to wgbh.org slash podcast slash the Big Dig. All right, well, that's it for tonight. But come back tomorrow. Adam Riley and his Talking Politics panel will go over the biggest stories of 2023 and what we can expect in the new year. That and more tomorrow at 7. I'm Crystal Haynes. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.